On today's show, should the Houston Rockets consider going after either Draymond Green or Kristaps Porzingis this offseason? We're going to weigh the pros and cons of both of those potential Houston Rockets targets, as well as what should the Rockets do with the 20th pick in this year's NBA draft? We'll weigh some possible trades and what the most likely outcome is for that 20th overall selection in this year's draft. It's all coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select Jalen Green, Alperon Shengun, and Jabari Smith Jr. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Hey, Houston fans, I am so happy. You're getting somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come, come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two. One. Zero. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian, a credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Now, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, official sports book of Locked On. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked On Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on the way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you for making LOR part of your day every single day. Joining us now is your weekly co-host, Frank, from the Rockets Chop Shop. You can track down on Twitter at FTank58, as well as at HTX Chop Shop. And be sure to follow along on YouTube at the Rockets Chop Shop for a ton of amazing Rockets coverage and content. Frank, we've got a couple interesting names to talk about here today. One that you brought up when we spoke either last week or the week before last. Yeah, yeah. That was like, yeah, I think it was two weeks ago I first evoked the name. Yeah, yeah the, the name Kristaps Porzingis. And in the aftermath of the Bradley Beal trade, Beal being sent to the desert, that nerd, that no trade clause basically dictating where he ultimately wound up going, uh, Kristaps Porzingis is in like a weird spot. Like, you know, do the Wizards, are they trying to bottom out? Are they trying to offload all these contracts? Are they just valuing cap space? We'll talk about that. We'll also talk about Draymond Green as a potential target for the Rockets because he has officially decided to opt out of his contract. Everybody expected him to do that. That's not necessarily the surprise here. But now the option becomes real of him either renegotiating a deal with the Warriors or pursuing other free agency destinations or even executing a sign and trade with the Warriors so that they can extract some value for him. I don't know how you feel about Draymond. He is a name that like I've tinkered with before here on this mm-hmm. show and in other Rockets discussions because I think there could be a really interesting like pairing there if you were to bring him in as like your main like veteran addition piece to try and I don't know teach these kids like how to play you know how to you know de- you know doing defense the right way like all that all the stuff that he kind of brings to the table as a leader a guy who's been there done that with title teams I know Draymond ex-warrior guy who stopped the Rockets during their title years like that kind of stings a little bit but if you take some of that out of the equation I think it could be a really interesting addition for this team yeah um I totally agree I'm big 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 Draymond fan um regardless of all the undercutting Clint Capella poking Harden in the eye all this all the you know all the stuff he does the antics he does on the court and obviously we know his uh exploits off the court with his teammates are well documented but um at, on the basketball note I I have him ranked second behind Steph as the most important person in the Warriors dynasty um and he is that that important um uh, the fit on the Rockets it's still kind of undefined but from the things you named which is those intangible things, leadership, accountability, a veteran presence. I think those are the things that you would overpay because it would be overpay for Houston to try to get Draymond, especially if if he's a free agent, regardless of his limitations as a shooter, a lot of teams are going to want that guy on their on their roster. Um, so I think for us 
to get a guy like that in house, uh, you know, first battle hall of famer, it would really transform the culture along with Ime Udoka and some of the other moves the Rockets are making. Now we could discuss, you know, whether who we draft, some of the players on the roster as far as on the X's and O's standpoint. But I think just based on his skill set as a guy that could facilitate, a guy that could run the show if need be, and uh, one of the best defenders in NBA history and still showed some of that uh, in the playoffs, especially against the Kings, that he still has a lot in the tank to give. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all for Draymond. I think it will be a great addition, especially where we are right now. Yeah. And that, that kind of, that type of an addition would kind of change the dynamic of what we're looking at for the, you know, the biggest need for the Rockets. I've been saying for a while, right. They need to add like a, a veteran to that three spot on the floor because we kind of predict Jabari and Shingun to be the four and the five moving forward. But in a world where, you know, hopefully Jabari can be that kind of three, four, five tweener type player. Then you could throw Draymond at the four, and then that's your starting front court with those three guys, and then he becomes your veteran presence. But at the four spot, that fit is a little weird next to Shingun, depending on how well Shingun is shooting the basketball. Because in today's NBA, right, if you have multiple non shooters on the floor, we've seen different iterations of this Rockets team with multiple non shooters. It can get a little congested, but. As long as those non-shooters are still high-level playmakers, which Alperin Shingun is, Draymond Green is, and you ideally have somebody who's drawing up the X's and O's with maybe a teensy bit more creativity behind the wheel, then you should be able to execute at a high level and still be able to make stuff happen, even if you've got a couple guys who aren't necessarily shooting the ball lights out from three-point land. Yep, and some of the best lineups that the Rockets had um, this past season uh, featured, you know, Al P with KJ. Mm-hmm. Or Al P with um, you know, some of them the subset, small subset, because him and Tate don't mix well with Tate. There are some good lineups with Tate. And, you know, KJ Martin, you know, I love him because he plays smart. He cuts when he needs to. Um, he's not a, like the best shooter in the world, but he'll he'll uh hit some shots as need be. But his the real weapon that KJ brings to the table is the ability to play with high IQ, cut when he needs to, be able to um give you multiple looks as a screener and just play smart basketball. Basically, Draymond is that times a thousand. So you're going to get base all the things without the athleticism that KJ does. But I'm talking about in the short roll, ability to roll to the basket, to play make, to cut on a dime, to facilitate for other players cutting. So I I think there's a world where with even with Alperin, which is kind of that that two man lineup with KJ and Alperin, they're so dynamic together. I would see a world where KJ uh, with uh, Alperin and Draymond. Uh, playing together. All of this is going to be really heightened by the ability for Shangun to be able to hit those little floaters he has and ha- add a little bit of a perimeter game, not necessarily the three point game, but just shooting um, somewhere around the paint, being able to hit those mid range shots. And I think that's something that he's already shown that he's going to be good at uh, going forward. Uh, defensively, how him and Shangun would would match up, um, he would just play that low man. And I think Draymond is one of the best in the business at doing that, especially guarding the pick and roll and helping off on, on the pick and roll. We've seen it with Andrew Bogut, Zaza Pachulia, all these kind of quote unquote slow footed bigs that the Warriors would trot out and still be a top 10 defense that play high minutes for them. Um, and so I, I really don't see uh, it as an issue defensively. Obviously, our backcourt has to be better. Uh, Jalen has to become a much better shooter, much more efficient. And whoever they add on the team along with Jalen, we know Kevin Porter can shoot. Um, They would have to be better at shooting. Jabari has to be a better shooter. Um, He cannot be first half of the season Jabari. He has to be that number uh, three overall pick, the guy we saw at Auburn. If that's the case, then, yeah, that could be a very dangerous team. And we talk about, right, you know, there's there's the reporting out there that, you know, Ime Odoka wants to add like a stable, you know, a stable veteran presence with the, the point guard spot. I think this kind of could be that, right? Like Draymond can be the guy running your offense where, you know, it's not a traditional, stand, you know, offense in the sense like the, the same way the Warriors run their stuff, right? Is, yeah, Steph runs the offense sometimes, but they also run a lot of their actions through Draymond. And he is kind of their primary creator by and large for a lot of the offensive sets that they run. So then that kind of feeds into the idea of what Ime's already talked about doing, which is capitalizing on Kevin Porter Jr. as an off-the-ball player, right? Using his shooting and that gravity that he provides from that standpoint. So rather than maybe going out and pursuing a 
Fred Van Vliet and giving him, you know, three years, 90 million, 100 million, whatever, you maybe overpay for Draymond a little bit and he's your immediate answer if there's not a better, you know, point guard, you know, playmaking prospect person out there to bring in to actually run the show because that would also allow them to continue the kind of Kevin Porter Jr. experiment, if you will, but with a different set of uh, supporting characters around him, I guess, to really kind of unlock what he is good at rather than making him be the guy be the primary decision maker, the primary creator, all of that stuff. Uh, but if they're not willing to pony up two hundred million for James Harden and four years, I don't know how much, how far they'd be willing to go ultimately for Draymond Green. Because you're absolutely right, they would have to overpay to get him. But it's about whether or not you could overpay to get him on like a short, like one or two year deal, like a balloon payment type thing, or if it would, or if he's seeking like a full blown four year maximum deal. That's going to be the breaking point, I think. Yeah, and, and that's really what it's going to come down to. Um, and obviously him and James Harden playing together, I don't think you would be able to kind of finagle both of those um, without really getting dicey with the money. Um, and for him, I, it would just be for him to think to come to Houston. Maybe it's a chance for him to prove his worth on the market. Maybe he sees it as, a, as an opportunity to show that he isn't reliant on Steph and Clay and that whole warrior system to be the player that he is. Maybe we can tell him that this is your team, Draymond. You're here. You're the guy. Obviously, his playing style isn't he's going to take 30 shots. But when you say this, is your team means we want you to be a leader here. We want you to guide our franchise and to usher us into this next generation, um, um, this next phase that we're trying to get into. And maybe that's something that appeals to him. Uh, you know, there's a lot of factors with these players, as as we've seen with some of the movement that that's going on in the NBA that makes them pick certain locations that they go to. Um, but even expanding out from that, if you think about the skill set he, he provides is one of the main reasons I'm I'm excited if we did, did draft a man Thompson, because um, I think there's like a misconception about spacing um, in the NBA. Obviously, shooting is one of the, the best floor spacers, but the ability to play, make and pass is also a form of spacing because it does take advantage of the defense um, trying to commit or decommit to certain players. And if you have a guy that could play, make like Thompson does. That's why I use the comp for him is a backcourt dream on. And I think if he can reach that ceiling, um, he would be a great player. Um, he could be, a, you know, all NBA level player if he's able to defend at the level and be able to play, make and read the game with, as, with one of the best minds uh, in the NBA. So I think if if I'm OK with a man, Thompson coming to the Rockets, I'm very OK with Draymond Green uh, being here as a veteran and adding all the other intangibles he brings. Coming up, another potential target for the Houston Rockets to consider Kristaps Porzingis with the Washington Wizards. What ultimately happens with him in the aftermath of the Beal trade? Also, we'll take a look at some options with the Rockets' 20th pick in this year's draft. We're going to get there in just one moment. But first, today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. In life, it is really, really easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs for you and never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. Therapy can help give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind or feeling you know, super burned out, all, all that, right? If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find more balance in your life with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA today to get 10% off your very first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on NBA. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Frank, you were the one originally that presented this idea, and I, you know, I can't say that, I, that I'd actually really considered it before. But in a vacuum, it makes a lot of sense. Kristaps Porzingis as a candidate that fits in so seamlessly next to Alper and Shingun, right? And is, is kind of everything you could kind of want and envision in a four ne playing next to Alper and Shingun and all the skills that he brings to the table, right? The shooting, the size, the defensive capability, the rim protection, all of it. It kind of answers a lot of those issues that you have when Alp is your starting five. And now we're in this spot where maybe, you know, a few days ago, it didn't seem, you know, we kind of didn't know if it was a like a realistic possibility, if you will. His future was a little bit murky. Were the Wizards going to try and be competitive? Were they going to tear it all down? They've moved on from Bradley Beal. They dealt him to the Suns. And so now they're in this position where they're still trying to figure out what they're going to do with Chris Paul. They've got to reroute him to a third team or they're trying to reroute him to a third team. 
I kind of envision, I've seen a couple of Wizards people talk about this, that they might like have Chris Paul actually play in Washington this season and have him like try to boost up the trade value of guys like Kristaps Porzingis because you have a guy like Chris Paul who elevates the play of everybody else and kind of gas them up a little bit and then get more value. So they might not be quite ready to fire sale everybody on that roster, but for the right you know, trade package, they might be willing to say yes, assuming Porzingis opts into his deal or potentially via a sign and trade. But the fit with the Rockets, I don't think, like, I think you were onto something here with this idea, man. Like, the more right. that I think about it, the more that I kind of warm up to this is, like, you know, you're considering, you know, the 60-something million. Maybe you just absorb them into the cap space, whatever. Like, I could see it making a lot of sense for a variety of different reasons instead of, say, like, a guy like Brooke Lopez. Yeah, and the fit to me is, is a, it's a nice fit. Because you think about one of the reasons I wanted Ch Chet as a rocket um, in the Jabari's classes draft in the 22 draft was because of rebounding, stretching the floor, rim protection. One of the reasons a lot of people wanted um, Wemby in this draft, ability to rebound, rim protection, stretching the floor. And that archetype, the same thing with uh, Miles Turner, you have Chris Stapps there. He fits all of that. Um, he is a guy that, you know, he's not a like a super efficient shooter, but he is a floor spacer and he can space the floor. He shoots deep, deep threes. Um, the rim protection is there and, you know, uh, he can play off ball. He can play as a, as a lob threat because he's still a great athlete despite all the injuries. I think the lob knock threat. on him that every, <laughs> I think the knock on him that everybody gives is his uh, past injury history, which, you know, it is a fair thing. Um, and this last season, he was able to play a, a substantial amount of games, actually looked really, really good in Washington. Uh, we discussed this last time regarding how I feel like in Dallas, he was being underutilized to get him on the Rockets. I have to think, like, what do the Wizards want to do from reading all the stories surrounding the Brad Bradley Bill trade? They are trying to tank and. Even the trade itself screams to um, that what they value at this point is financial flexibility more than anything, because you don't you don't basically uh, take a trade like that um, unless you just value that. And they got, you know, they got some second round picks and, you know, basically well, the, 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 the no Landry trade, Shaman. the no trade clause played some part in that. But you, I, I do fully agree. Right. Like they were kind of backed into a corner with what they could accomplish. But it does very much seem like the goal is is financial flexibility moving forward. Yeah. And and the reason I say that, even the, the contracts they took back, uh, Chris Paul has, I think he has some, it's team options, maybe for like the next two seasons or something like that. Um, but his contract is very team friendly. I, I personally don't think Chris Paul is going to play in Washington. Um, I think he's probably going to be moved to a contender or um, or they might just do the, you know, the the John Wall thing, because I think they are really going to try to tank. Well, the other the other and, angle with Chris Paul was I think the Clippers were mentioned as like a strong suitor to try right. and land him and the contracts that the Clippers would be sending back. And this is where you can read even further into the idea of the salary cap relief. The financial flexibility is the Clippers have a bunch of expirings and all the names that were being lobbed as potential. We're names, yeah, we're expiring. So like Eric Gordon would be a candidate to throw in there because he's got the non guaranteed you know deal, all of that. So there would be a lot of uh or the the option that you would pick up right that becomes an expiring contract effectively so there's that that's that's i think the the direction for, you know absolutely that they're trying to head yeah and I, like so if chris paul's out i think if they're gonna tank they need to keep that theme of financial flexibility and get um porzingis out of there because um you know he's the 30 say if he does, I'm sure he's going to opt in. I, I don't see a world where he doesn't. Um, I think he's going to opt in. If he does, it's going to come down to um, are they willing to part ways with him uh, just as a as a free agent? Or are they going to be able to, once again, like just trade him out and take a low return for him to value that flexibility? Now, how the Rockets can get into that. Um, obviously we have seconds and we have some, you know, future seconds that we could possibly use to try to get him. Now, you know, for $36 million, the way I value him as a contract, even as an expiring contract, using second round picks is the same way that I value cap flexibility, which is basically his contract is just going to eat a spot. You're kicking the can down the road another summer. And if he does fit well, you're basically giving him a trial, you know, on the team. If he likes it, if the Rockets like it, we could sit and talk this coming summer. Um, if it doesn't fit, 
guess what? The 2024 free agency class, the 2024, uh, the players that become, uh, you know, that the trades that might pop up, it's a much, much better market than this current year. So that's kind of how I view that going down just as a, hey, let's kick the tires on Chris Tapps for Zingas. We have the cap space. He's an interesting player that fits well with the things we're trying to do. Um, if we like him, then we can discuss. Maybe we can get him on a shorter team-friendly contract going forward. Um, if not, then you can just move on and just use that cap space to sign somebody else that shakes loose. As we see, you know, the NBA is a soap opera. Every week, it's somebody coming uh, coming out saying, trade me out of here. Uh, I don't want to be here. So there's always going to be players available um, in the market. And the benefit to having Porzingis on what would be a $36 million expiring contract is you know, if somebody does shake loose in the middle of the season, the Rockets are really yes. interested in, then he's that expiring deal, right? That's one of the things that is so important and so beneficial is that some of the contracts that the Rockets are going to be looking to sign this offseason in this free agency period are going to be deals that are probably not going to be players that are on this team the next time this team is trying to win titles, but are going to be the players that get packaged for the, you know, the next star or the next guy who gets brought in to help lead the charge when Jalen and Jabari and Shingun and those guys are ready to start competing for titles, right? You have to have movable salary in the NBA to be able to make trades happen. And that's one of the spots that's been really difficult for the Rockets these last two years. They haven't had a ton of like movable salary to really play around with because they basically dealt with the John Wall contract for the past couple of years, just eating up a ton of money on the books that they haven't been able to do anything with. They previously before that they had the Russ deal. They had the Chris Paul deal. Like they yeah. just haven't had a ton of flexibility. They basically had one to two gigantic contracts and then a bunch of really small contracts. None of those mid tier contracts that make some of these hypothetical trades a little bit easier, kind of greasing the wheels on some of these trades. And again, the expiring angle of it is very important. So are you saying that it would be a bad idea to sign James Harden to a four-year, $200 million max? Because basically all you just said is that. I mean, if the Bradley Bill trade doesn't teach us anything, is that you shouldn't like give these guys that aren't really worth what they're trying to get paid for, their their past performance, their um, their reputation. And that's these contracts are a lot about reputation. Oh, yeah. We should not be in the market for anything like that because it's going to just cripple you going forward. And once again, the Wizards ate a bunch of second round picks knowing that, you know, they're going to be taking the L on this trade because of financial flexibility. So when people poo poo bringing in the James Harden, oh, yeah, you can just give him this. That is just as valuable as picks, having that freedom to be able to sign any player that comes up, you want to be ready to make those moves. So, and that's why I'm with you. Anything that we do has to be something that's on a short-term basis that allows us to pivot when we have to pay the young guys we currently have now, if they're up to the, up to par for it, and then add some great players that come out in the free agency or trade market. Could not agree more. Speaking of pivoting, we're going to pivot to the 20th pick in the draft that the Rockets have. So far, the expectation is the Rockets are not going to make that 20th pick selection. So what can they do with the pick? We're going to explore some options here coming up in just one moment. But first, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Baseball season is in full swing and there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't pay out. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to join today. Right now, you can take a look at the World Series odds over at FanDuel. The Atlanta Braves, the favorites right now at plus 380. The LA Dodgers at plus 440. Tampa Bay Rays at plus 450. And then your Houston Astros in four Fourth place right now at plus 850 to win it all this season. And then in fifth place, the Arlington Rangers at plus 1,200. So don't miss your chance to snag the no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball trademarks used with permission. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Frank, the Rockets have the 20th pick in this year's draft. And unlike previous years, because so much of like I remember, you know, last couple years having the, the you know, couple different picks in the teens or you had the, the, the Jalen draft I had the two back to back picks in the 20s. Last year I had pick 17. I remember doing all these deep dives on different different prospects and like trying to figure out who would make sense and who's the best value at all these picks. I've barely done any research on the guys Same. that could be had around pick 20 because 
it's like such a foregone conclusion at this point. That pick is going to get moved in some capacity. The the unsexy move is basically just trading it for a future protected first. Um, that's the kicking the can down the road option. That's the one that actually in our internal locked on mock draft we did, I traded the pick to the New York Knicks for a protected 2024 first round draft pick. Um and it was top 10 protections, so not like a major move, but basically just keeping it liquid, right? Because it's like when you buy yeah. a car, right? You drive it off the lot, it immediately depreciates and loses like, you know, 35, 40% of its value. If you have to make that pick at 20, then suddenly you have a rookie that you have to develop and grow and all that. And there's not nearly as much intrinsic value in a rookie as there is in a shiny potential future first. So the Rockets could also package that pick though. And I think when you're looking at this roster and how things are probably looking like they're going to play out, I think two of the biggest question marks and their roles moving forward are going to be KJ Martin and Jay Sean Tate, right? And like, are they the odd men out on the roster if they add a high level wing? I mean, conceivably a majority of your wing minutes are going to be committed to Jabari, Tari, and then whoever they add in free agency. Maybe it is a... Dylan Brooks type or something, right? Like those are going to be the three guys eating up the majority of the minutes on your wing. You're not going to have enough time for Jay Shantae and KJ Martin. Packaging that pick with one of those guys could net you at least a somewhat decent return. Yep. And I think the way I look at it with that pick, like you, I have not, you know, that's why when people ask me, who's your board? Mine stops like at eight <laughs> because I've, I've done this for like two years in a row. You're doing all these deep dives and you know, we were just like, okay, we didn't even get the guy we wanted. So um, I will leave that to Madison. That's his thing. He, he, there we go. A, he shout shout, shout out to Madison. Thing. Shout out to Madison, bro. Um, the way I see it, it depends on who we draft first. And I think that'll determine, and I'm, I'm with you. I think the last resort will be trading it for the future because that's kind of like, okay, at least we didn't get anything we wanted out of this draft. So let's just try to keep it moving and kick it down the road. And maybe we can, something good comes out of it later. In this current uh, uh, setting that we have right now, if they get a guard out of that number four pick or they somehow land on a guard, I think you have to pair that with one of those players you mentioned to go get a uh, wing out of the the uh, other teams, uh, whoever it is out there. I'm just going to say wing archetype. Um, I don't really have any anybody queued up for like a trade for a wing, but, you know, there's some wings out there that we could add that bring shooting. I think that's what they're going to be looking for. Some defense, but I think shooting is going to be the higher premium. If we land on the on a on a wing in the fourth pick like a Brendan Miller or God forbid, uh, Cam Whitmore. I know some of y'all love him. I don't not not as much as um, the number four pick. Uh, but if we do get a wing, then I think potentially you could see that pick package with um a guard and the best guard that has the most value as far as with trades would be Kevin Porter Jr. Now, if you look at the way the like we discussed this earlier, the way the Rockets uh, uh, roster is set up, we don't have a lot of tradable salaries that really are going to bring back any value. Um, at this point, most of the trades we're going to make, if they're significant, we're absorbing them into our salary already because we're not going to be able to send back matching salaries because we don't have it. A lot of our guys are still on rookie deals. Uh, most of them are making minimums. I think Tate and uh, KPJ are the ones that have the biggest salary. So yeah, Tate, for, Tate, for Tate's some, floating about seven million, and then KPJ will be sixteen once his new deal kicks in starting July first. Right. So like those those are your two like mid tier salaries to be able to do something within a major trade. Yep. And if if depending on who's available, you might see a world where maybe both of them get put together um, for that 20th pick. I think it's a valuable pick. And in, in as far as what we're noticing in the NBA right now, and I want everybody to keep this in mind, the, the dynamic of the new CBA and how it's structured is changing the value of later picks. It's increased the value of later picks, especially for teams that are trying to contend. Because when you think about drafting top picks, expect like the Denver Nuggets, the trade they did with OKC, what it did was gave them a bunch of later picks that they could still trust their scouting departments to add uh, players that may be worth it, worth it for them, but they don't have to pay them as much as you would a number eight pick, number nine pick, because that stuff really, really adds up. Everything is on the margins now. So the 20th pick, 
is valuable to somebody. Somebody would yeah, be that, that could to, be the next that could be the next yeah. Christian Brown for them, right? Like he was playing yep. legitimate finals minutes for them because they need guys like that that they can get on those rookie scale deals that are gonna be cheap, a long term team controlled contracts. Because when you've already got you're locked into your big three of Jokic, MPJ, Jamal Murray, like or and any teams out there, right? The Suns could exactly. be a contender to maybe want to have that that twentieth pick potentially because they're gonna be exactly. locked into Beal, Booker, and KD now for God knows how many years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's a nasty. That is not a super team. I don't care what nobody says. Uh, it is not a. You can't go out in the second round and be, be a super team. Um, but yeah, I think it's just the the dynamic for that. I think the Rockets are sitting pretty with that. I would perf- preferably want to trade that pick out, use it to go get a position of need um, in an established veteran that we can get uh, on the open market. Um, there are a lot of great guards. One of the names that I I don't know if it was on here or I discussed it somewhere. Uh, off the Celtics, you know, they're going to be in a little weird spot trying to pay all the guys they have. Maybe um, you get uh, Derek White or Marcus Smart. One of them become available. That 20th pick is valuable for a team like Boston. Brogdon could be um, an interesting to make name too. Brogdon would be a, 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 you know, a great name to try to bring in, you know, bring shooting. He's, he is a bit of a combo guard, um, but, you know, he can play make. He's a high, high, high IQ guy, high, high character type of player. These are the type of moves the Rockets need to make. Everything that we bring in needs to be high value, high character, something that could help the team and be a veteran that can help lead these guys. And I think that 20th pick, I'd be shocked if it's not moved for a player um, in the in the draft on Thursday. It's on Thursday, bro. That's crazy just to say that. I it's know, man. It is it is right around the corner. We are right on the doorstep of this year's NBA draft. It's going to be super exciting. Of course, we're going to have you covered for all of it here. And again, me being the amazing, apparently, journalist that I am, I love bearing the lead on this. Uh, I will be in attendance yep. at the NBA draft, so that's going to be a ton of fun. So be sure to follow along. I'll be in New York for this year's draft. It should be a total blast. I guess I'll have you guys covered you know, live from the draft floor with a reaction to whatever the Rockets ultimately do. Uh, if I show up to New York for the draft, Frank, and they somehow trade that pick, I am going to be beside myself boo, with rage. Boo them. Dude, no, yeah, no, I'll, boo them. I'll, I'll boo. I'll get my credential revoked, all that good stuff. But yeah, I mean, if, if security <laughs> isn't escorting you out, then we can't talk, bro. If they trade the pick, I need you to be belligerent. Try to rest the stage. We're rush the stage. Just, there we go. Do all of that, right? On our behalf. There we on, go. On behalf of the fan base. We'll there we go. You out, okay? uh, right. I'll, I'll be. I'll be a legend, but I'll be barred from any official <laughs> NBA sanctioned events for the rest of my life. It'll be so worth it. On that note, man, let everybody know where they can track you down at. Yeah, so I'm on the Rockets Chop Shop. You know, on YouTube and F Tank Fifty Eight on Twitter. And that's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available on all podcast platforms. We're also available on YouTube. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.